God compares an akazu so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church but to be empty. So spiritual things and spiritual heritages are not just communicated by impartations. They are not just communicated through atmospheres. They are communicated through doctrine. They are communicated through a set of teachings that represent our belief system. And one of the things we must do in church is to teach people these things until they know it and they are able to communicate it. If you look at what he said, he, he outlined some very sensitive things. Go back to Luke chapter 1 verse 1 and see the way this guy communicated these things. Because it's one thing to know truth. It's another thing to communicate it. There are two different things entirely. How you come to know what you know and how you communicate it is completely different. And communicating truth must be methodical if it will be impactful and relevant. You don't just communicate truth haphazardly. People will be doing many things. They won't know the one that produce results. And even if they have results, they won't have the capacity to replicate results because they don't understand the methods, the systematic approach to spiritual realities. He said they have set forth in order. That's the first word. There is an orderly manner in the presentation of truth. They didn't just scatter it everywhere. They set it forth in order. And he said those things that were set forth in order are the things that are most surely believed. That means there are other things we believe, but the foundation of our faith does not rest on it. So they know the things that are the majors and they know the things that are the minors. And then the things that are the majors, they were set forth in order, in a structured and methodical manner. And then he went further to emphasize the fact that he gained perfect understanding. So a man cannot have perfect understanding except as truth is communicated to him in order. He said, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, all the things that are important were communicated in order. And because they were communicated in order, he gained perfect understanding. And he said, now that I have perfect understanding, it seemed good to me also, discipling you to communicate these same things to you in that orderly manner. This is how the heritage of the faith is preserved. When it is communicated in order, when it is understood, and when it is transferred from one generation to another. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, when Paul was talking to Timothy, he said, the things that you have received from me before many witnesses, he said, the same communicate to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. So you see that these guys, at every time, they were concerned about four generations, at least. The ones they received, they communicated to their own disciples, and they wanted their own disciples to communicate to their own disciples. So by all means, truth should be secured for four generations. That is what brings about Im impact when it has to do with understanding spiritual things. And we said there are several things that we needed to consider. And so we took time to break them down. And I highlighted a few of them. The first, I said, is the doctrine of God. We need to understand who God is. And I said in theology, we summarize that doctrine as theology, the study of God. The word theology is from two words, theo and logos. Theo is God, logos means study. So it's the study of God. And then we said the second thing is Christology. Because as you study God, like we are doing and we are going to continue tonight, you will discover that the understanding and the expression of the mode of his existence is as a triune being. So you have the Father, you have the Son, who is the Christ, and you have the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of the Father. So if we study the person of God from the perspective of the Father and the Godhead, we are also going to study the person of God from the perspective of the Christ. So studying God in the person of Christ is what we call, call Christology. And then we have pneumatology, studying God from the person of his spirit. If you understand this, I said, your worship will be accurate and your existence will have meaning. This is why it's very important. Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan. He said, you know not what you worship. He said, but we know who we worship. 
So it's one thing to be religious, doing a lot of things, and you don't even know the one you are worshipping. So for your worship to be accurate, and for you to receive the most of God in order to find meaning in your existence, you need to understand who God is. And in dealing with God, you must know the Father, you must know the Son, you must know the Holy Ghost, and you must also know how they coexist together as one. We are going to deal with that, and then we say we'll look at the doctrine of scriptures. That is called bibliography. We need to understand the scripture from several perspectives. Because if you don't understand the scripture, you have a lot of problems. In order for me to understand, first of all, the inspiration of the scriptures. Where does the word come from? You need to understand the inerrancy of scripture. That means scriptures cannot err. The accuracy and precision of scripture. You need to understand the authority of scripture. Why does scripture have authority and it becomes the basis for both belief and practice as far as the Christian faith is concerned. And then you need to also understand the clarity of scripture. Because although scripture contain the mysteries of God, it is understandable. And so you need to understand how to present it in an understandable manner. And then you also need to understand the art of biblical interpretation, hermeneutics. How is scriptures explained? It is when you understand all of these things that scriptures will begin to make meaning. Because there are many Christians who think the Bible is another history book. And that is so because they don't understand hermeneutics. They don't understand inerrancy of scripture. They don't understand the authority of scripture. They don't understand the clarity of scripture. So they just look at it as another book. The Bible is not another book. The Bible is the word of God. And you need to interact with it as such. But for that to come into your consciousness, you must be taught what the Bible represents from all of this perspective. So that's bibliography. Because we believe in the Holy Scripture. It's one of the things that is most surely believed amongst us. And then we also looked at anthropology, which is the doctrine of man. Because there's a way we believe man to be. Others consider man to be another biological being. Just like an animal that operates by blood and has a mind. But we understand man from a deeper sphere. We understand man to be the image of God, created in his likeness. It is on the strength of that that we know that man cannot have meaning except as he has relationship with God. And so if you don't understand who man is from the perspective of God, you will think man is all about existing and having what to eat and what to drink. But we know that man has a deeper meaning than just walking around. This is what informs how we live our lives. And so you may be living your life fully committed to God. Somebody else who doesn't know man from the depths of his creation may think you are foolish. It is actually a function of his ignorance. Otherwise, why do you need to waste time every week to come sit in church and listen to the word of God twice or thrice a week? Why do you need to earn your money and then you come drop it on an, in an offering basket that you are giving an offering? For what? The man who doesn't know who man is thinks life is all about transaction. Anything that does not bring about increase is not necessary. But you have a deeper meaning. You know that your essence is connected to God. So we need to also understand who man is from the perspective of God. So that we will know the essence of man and we also know the purpose of man. Because every one of us sitting here, we have a unique purpose in God. He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I ordained you to be a prophet. I'm doing this recap because somebody may just stumble on this message and he wouldn't have heard the last two teachings. So he wouldn't know where we are coming from or where we are going to. And so we said we're also going to look at the doctrine of salvation. And we said that is called soteriology. Because once upon a time man fell. And until man is saved, Jesus said the flesh profited nothing. So a man can be a billionaire but he doesn't have relevance where it, relevance where it matters. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his soul? So when a Christian is evaluating life and existence, he is evaluating life from different places, different structures, and different understanding. Somebody else can think, if I'm the richest man in the world, that's all I need. There was such a man called the rich fool. He gathered his barn, and everything was free. He said, now my soul will rest. And the owner of the soul called him. <laughs> what do you mean by rest? There's a difference between rest and relaxation. You can relax on your own, but if you need rest, it can only be given. Because there remains a rest for a particular people who find God. 
So rest is not a product of relaxation. Rest is a product of attaining the standards of God. And for you to ever find rest, you must be saved and you must understand the power of your salvation. So we need to also understand that aspect. So we are going to deal with it because salvation is one of the things most surely believed amongst us. And we said we are also going to do the study of demonology to understand our enemies. The Bible says we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. If you are ignorant, you will be in trouble. And so the reason we are studying demonology is not to search out the power of Satan. We already know that as believers, we have authority over every principality and power and every name that is named both in this world and in the world that is to come. But in order not to be ignorant of the strategies of the devil, it's important for us to study how he operates so that we will know how to walk within the boundary of our victory in Christ. For example, a quarrel can just emanate between two people who are fulfilling purpose. If they don't know how the devil operates, they will kill themselves. But if they understand that one of the ways the devil operates is to divide people, they will look beyond that quarrel. They will not even bother to study the facts, who is right or wrong. They will make peace. Because peace is more important than who is right or wrong. Because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. In that level of of wisdom and that level of approach to life we only come if you understand how the devil works so we need to also study demonology not because it's a core of our salvation but it impacts on our victory in life and then we say we'll study the doctrine of the church ecclesiology why do we gather together who are we what what is our identity and what are we here for it is part of the things that we believe and then finally we say we have to study eschatology which is the doctrine of the end time. There is a way this world will end. There is a way man will end. If you think this world is just another random manifestation, born out of explosion of matter, <laughs> you are joking. At the end of time, every one of us will appear before a throne. We will first of all be judged either unto salvation or condemnation and then we will be judged for rewards. Because God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. It is your understanding of how this world will end that will determine the caution with which you live your life now. And so these are some of the things we want to examine in, as a way of understanding the things that are most surely believed amongst us. And in order to do this, we began from the very first, which is the doctrine of God. And so last week, we looked at, um, we began studying the doctrine of God and we said the doctrine of God or theology is, a, is an aspect of, of knowledge called theism. When anybody begins to explore God, he has entered a realm of knowledge called theism. And we said there are two dimensions to theism. The first dimension to theism is a belief system that does not believe in the existence of God. And then the second aspect of theism is a belief system about God that believes in his existence. So there are people in this world that are non-theistic. That means they don't believe in the existence of God. And there are people in this world that are theistic. That means they believe in the existence of God. In order to give better clarity, we decided to categorize them into basic aspects of this belief system. And so for the non-theistic people, we said there are four major non-theistic views. Number one, we said atheism. And those who practice atheism are called atheists. What is this belief system? They don't believe God exists at all. And so as far as they are concerned, they are their own God. Anything they want to do is what they will do. There's no consequence about it. They decide how to live their lives. And should any consequence come from it, they are willing to handle it. They are the God of themselves because there's no God anywhere. That's the atheistic view. And then we say we have the agnosticism. And we say the agnosticism is practiced by people called agnostics. And what do they believe? They believe God may exist, but man does not have the mental competence to find him. And so if God exists and we cannot find God, it's better to just sustain a willful ignorance. So the agnostic is not arguing that God does not exist, but as far as he's concerned, even if he does, you can't know him. So let's just enjoy our ignorance and go away. So for the agnostic, his willful ignorance is his God. 
And then we say we have the pragmatism. Or those who are called pragmatists. And what is this belief system? They believe that what you can see and touch is what is. Forget the idea of God. If you cannot verify it scientifically, if you cannot verify it factually, forget any other thing you are doing. Everything you are doing as far as they are concerned is mysticism. So they deal with life as they see it. And so what they see and touch is their God. So as far as they are concerned, there is no God anywhere. The earth is about facts. The earth is about reality. What you know, see and touch as far as your senses are concerned. And then we have those that we call existentialisms. And the existentialism type of belief is a belief that sustains a faith kind of operation that the world is purposeless. So just enjoy yourself. Anything you do that brings enjoyment, just, leave, just do it while it lasts. That is what life is about. So life is about enjoying yourself and having fun. So every other holiday, they are looking for one of the places where there is a world wonder to go and enjoy themselves. So holiday in January, they are in Dubai. Holiday in February, they are in Tokyo. Holiday in March, they are in Bahamas. As far as they are concerned, life is pleasure. Enjoy, enjoy. Tom today you are here, tomorrow you are no more. And life is over. <laughs> There's nothing like God as far as they are concerned. So these are some of the major non-theistic views. And then we, we said, when you are dealing with the theistic views, there are also about four major theistic views. And we began to look at them. Five of them, actually. I said number one is pantheism. And I said pantheism believe there is God. But in pantheistic view, they believe everything is God and God is everything. So, so long as you are interacting with something, that thing holds a meaning. And because it holds a meaning, it is God unto itself. And that, er that view is erroneous because everything is not God. Rather, there is a God of everything. Are you following this? And then we said after the pantheistic view, we have the dualism view. And the dualism view believes that God is two opposite forces that has always been in contention with itself. So they have good and evil. They have light and darkness. So as far as they are concerned, anything, anything in this world has an opposite. And that opposite is a contrast. Those two forces opposing themselves to them is God. So it's good and evil that controls how we think. So good and evil must be God. If you do wrong, you feel bad. If you do good, you feel right. So that, that operation of good and evil in itself is a force. So it's a type of God. That's how they believe it. So that is called dualism. And then we have what we call polytheism. Polytheism believes everything is not God. But there are many gods. And I gave you an example of the Greek mythology. That has several gods. From Zeus to Ares to Helena. And so many of those gods. There's a god for everything. God of thunder. God of fertility. God of beauty. God of anger. God of death. So anything that is a major factor in life. There's a god watching over it. That's the polytheistic view. And I'm told that the Hindus have over 2 million gods. No wonder they are over 1.6 billion. Because they will need a lot of gods for that. <laughs> Glory to God. So there's polytheistic view. And then there is the view called deism. Deism believes there is God but is absent. So it's a belief system that suggests or postulates an absentee God. What does that mean? It is the power and principle of God that runs creation. But in essence and in being, God is not part of creation. So it's like God created the world and went on a journey. And allowed the world to be regulated by his power and his principle. He is not part of creation. So they believe in an absentee God. And then finally we have the monotheistic view. And I said the monotheistic view is the view that believes there is what? One God. And that is where Christians belong. However, I said it's not enough to just carve your niche as a monotheistic person. Because not only Christians, there are several other religions that also believe in one God. And many people make the mistake to say all of us are serving the same God. And so now they are even trying to advance for one world religion. That thing is from the pit of hell. 
Anybody who supports it is part of the Antichrist agenda. We are not all serving one God. The God we are serving is all by himself. He said, I am God and I'm God alone. There's none beside me. And that God has a way he manifested himself. Any other being that is worshipped who does not manifest himself like him is not our God. So please, don't go into political correctness. Don't go into under the pressure of being accepted by everybody. And then you come to sit with a Muslim, a Jew, a Silk, or a, a Mahurat. How do they call it now? You sit on the same table and say all of us are serving the same God. We are not all serving the same God. The God we serve is one God, but he has character. He has qualities. He has attributes. He has mode of manifestation. And for you who is a Christian, you must understand everything about your God so that you are not swept into the crowd to assume we are serving the same God and you encounter a spirit that you don't know. Are you following this? So we took our time to begin to study about our God. Those of us who have the belief system called Christianity. We took time to study our God. And I made a very profound statement. I said, our studying God does not mean we will know him. God cannot be taught by a man. God can only be revealed by his spirit. Jesus was speaking. He said, no one can know God except he whom the father reveals him to. But we are studying him because studying him will help us know about him. So that it becomes easier for him to be revealed to us. And so that when he is revealed to us, we can have confirmation. Oh, this is what the Bible said about him. That's right. This is what the Bible said about him. So if the Holy Ghost is revealing God to you, and the God that is being revealed to you is not holy, he will say no. What the Bible says about him is that he is holy. If the Holy Ghost reveals a God to you, and that God is not righteous, he will say no. The God that the Bible postulates is a righteous God. How come I'm not seeing these indicators? Are you seeing that? So every revelation you have about God must be consistent to what you know about him. This is why we are studying about him. So it makes it easy for him to be revealed and it also confirms him to you when it's revealed. As a young Christian, I used to study a lot the writings of Kenneth E. Hagin. And Kenneth Hagin met Jesus eight times. And on few of those occasions, Jesus will tell him something. He's seeing Jesus. They are talking. And when Jesus tells him something, he will tell Jesus, please show me in the Bible. And Jesus was never offended. Jesus will take him to the scripture and show him exactly what he was talking about. So he needed what he knew about God from scriptures to confirm the God that is being revealed to him. There are many people who don't know God from scripture. They take it is written for granted. And so they start encountering strange spirits. They fast for 40 days, they come back, they become mad. Because they don't know about God. So anything they see in the spirit realm, they say it's God. So long as it is esoteric, so long as it, it's a, an apparition, and so long as they are feeling something, they, they come back and start a deliverance ministry. And a demon enthrones himself over a territory. You now come later, you start seeing this deliverance ministry. They are taking money to pray for people. The God we know does what he does for free. You now come, this deliverance ministry, they are going to take their bath in the river by 12 midnight. And there's a special soap that this God gave. The God we know didn't give soap. He gave us the word and the spirit. This deliverance ministry, you now discover that immorality is rampant. In fact, they create a doctrine that balances it. This God, I know you encountered something, but... The character of this your God is not consistent with what is revealed. Are you following? So in order for you not to encounter a God to start a strange deliverance or prophetic or apostolic ministry, let's find out what the Bible said about God.